So, the talk for this morning, I'd just like to start with a gata from the Buddha. This very traditional way to do it in Buddhist countries, they do this. Garo bo cha ni wa to cha san tu ti cha katan yu ta kale na dhamma sa wa nang e tang manga la muta mang. So, and of course, this is the quiz part of the morning. What was that gata from? I think the traditional Buddhists know, you should all know actually, because I, I recited this gata about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Yes, yes. This is where you think, is this the only one he knows? <laughs> so, and what it means is, that they're very nice actually, and the meaning of it is uh, reverence or respect and humility, contentment and gratitude, timely listening to the Dhamma. This is the highest blessing. All of these ones are the highest blessing. So today it is going to be gratitude. I'm going to speak about gratitude. There is reverence, respect, humility, contentment, gratitude. And I talk about all of these things, actually, because these are wholesome emotions that are very useful for us to develop for our happiness and well-being, for our happiness and well-being. It's also good karma. So just briefly to mention what gratitude is, because um, I'll go I'll talk about it a little later, and it's thanks for what we've received. And this, of course, is what we've received from other people, you know, our parents, friends, family, or anyone, but also what we've received from life. And to a large extent, what we've received from our past karma, you know, is, is a part of that, uh, that inheritance that we have. And the Pali word, as you might have, I think the Buddhist, uh, traditional Buddhist would know, katanyuta, that's the Pali word for gratitude. Or gratitude is a bit... Uh, um, the volume's going up. <laughs> the gratitude is a bit of an abstract term. I like the expression of uh, gratitude, the emotional content of gratitude is thank you from the heart. Thank you from the heart. It's thankfulness. And this is uh, um, the, the part of the meaning of it, of katanyuta. Often they say in the Pali, katanyu katavedi. And katanyu is knowing what's been done. And then a katavedi is experiencing what has been done, with, in this case, with gratitude. So it's someone who knows or acknowledges what has been done and feels thankful or grateful for what, for what has been done. So this is what it is. I don't think anybody's really, anybody never uh, uh, doesn't know what gratitude is. Most people know what gratitude is. It's a very common human emotion. It's not only Buddhists. <laughs> Everyone has it, actually. And it also has a sense of appreciation and, um, and like uh, often a feeling of being blessed or lucky. So when I do a guided meditation, I'll do a bit of meditation during this talk too because I know many of you don't come, cannot come to the Tuesday night when I do the meditation, guided meditations. One of the meditations, I'll do a little bit of it this morning, is using words to bring up a feeling. And I feel the, what works for me in bringing up gratitude is I'm so lucky, I'm so lucky. And uh, it's very interesting when you hear that, what your response is to it. There's no correct response, just to be interested in how you respond when you hear, I'm so lucky. So this is, um, this is uh, an expression for me, at least, of gratitude and how we can bring it up. Find the right words for yourself, actually. And the Buddha said, uh, I'll quote from the Buddha, always like to, wait a minute. Monks, there are two persons that are hard to find in the world. What two? The one who is first to do a favour, Pubakari, and he or she who is grateful for what is done. These are the two persons hard to find in the world. It's true now. It was true in the Buddhist time. <laughs> it's true now. So things haven't changed that much. So today will be a bit more interactive, I think. We'll have a... So this first, uh, to begin with, I'll start this. This is an experiment that uh, I like to do uh, with gratitude. So I'd like everyone to just close their eyes for a moment and just to bring to mind, think of three things which you are currently thankful for or grateful for. Three things. And now, think of three things that could be better or be improved on.
So now, just th this is the test. Now you can open your eyes. If I just ask you, this is the test you asked, answer for yourself, actually. What was harder, to, to think of things that which you were grateful for, or things that could be better? Any, any replies, any responses? So was it easy, easier to be, uh, remember, to bring up to your mind things that you are currently thankful for or grateful? Or was it easier to bring up those things that you need to improve, change, um, make better? Any, any responses? Yes? That's it, yes, Claire. Yes. Exactly. That's where our minds are at, actually. We're working on the to-do list, aren't we? We've got, I must do this. Da, da, da. But the things that are there already, that have been achieved, that uh, um, we can be grateful for, thankful for, we, they don't come so easily because they're not on the to-do list. They're, they're on the done list. <laughs> so they, they don't come to mind. So this is... Uh, points to the nature of our minds, you know, and the way we've been trained. And the training is, of course, you know, in critical thinking. That's what I often mention. It's a very useful uh, thing to be trained in. And our educational system encourages critical thinking. And critical thinking sees what's missing, uh, what need could be improved on, how we could, uh, um, you know, uh, improve on whatever it is we are doing. Uh, someone was actually talking me, to me about the other day uh, about critiquing in academic uh, studies, it's, whether it's architecture or art. I think this, one, this person was in architecture. They have these critiques, and that's really tough for them, you know? <laughs> really tough. But this is the st sorts of mind states that we're encouraging through education. And of course that has its uses, and this is where we see all the great developments in science, in physical environment, and so on. But if we cannot turn it off when it comes to ourselves, we can't. And we start critiquing ourselves. We put ourselves on the spot and uh, give ourselves a hard time. And forget all the things that are there already that we can be very thankful about. So this is, this is something that's part and parcel of our educational system but and life. And, uh, but we can, as it were, bring balance to our lives by thinking of the things we already have. And this is gratitude. For, for sure, and contentment. And these, uh, Ajahn Brahm said, a quote, a quote Ajahn Brahm, he says, contentment and gratitude is part of that, really, is the fast track to enlightenment. So that's, that's a very, very, uh, very powerful thing, actually, contentment and gratitude. If we're grateful, it usually leads to a sense of contentment. You know, they sort of relate to each other quite well. Because if we're grateful to people, grateful to life, then we feel content with what we have. We're focusing on what's there rather than what's not there, which is critical thinking. What could be better, what we need, what we need to be happy. So uh, and this um, gratitude fits in with the very powerful um, uh, aspects of our lives, which we take for granted. It's giving and receiving. Giving is really, you know, in Buddhism, is a the Buddhist teaching, dana, is charged with spiritual significance and, and useful for developing wholesome states of mind. And so is receiving. And receiving, gratitude is part of receiving, well, being thankful. We can't always be grateful for what we received. <laughs> Sometimes that's quite a tall order. So they're powerful acts and they can give a rise to it. We're not always good at receiving. We're not always good at receiving. Sometimes people feel, and you see this actually, I see it in myself, you know, embarrassed or, or awkward about it. And sometimes people can feel unworthy. And this can be very true for monastics, you know, monks and nuns, because we rely on what people give us. And, uh, you know, uh, it, that can give rise to a feeling of, are we really worthy? And of course, we strive to be worthy of that. But some monks and nuns may feel like, I'm not worthy. And then they suffer, they really suffer. So, so this is aspect of receiving. Also, the, the problem we often have with receiving is we focus on the gift, don't we? We think, it's the wrong colour. <laughs> it's the wrong model. <laughs> or it's, it's not what I wanted. You know, this sort of thing, isn't it? 
rather than where the person's coming from who's giving it, you know. So this is a, a very important part of it. Just in relation to giving, though, this is not quite the, the subject of this talk, but a quotation I like a lot from uh, this motivational speaker. He's a um, Hare Krishna, a monk, I think, a monk, actually, Gaur Gopal Das. And he says, when people come to uh, temples and churches, and I say even Buddhist temples, <laughs> it's the same, they're always asking for something from God or the gods. We have the devas and this idea in Buddhism of the devas are not supreme beings. And they go there and ask for favours, you know. In Sri Lanka you see it a lot. There's devalias, these places where they have little shrines to the gods. And you go in there and you ask, oh, I want to pass my exam, I want to... You know, if I get over cancer, I'll come and I'll make an offering and all these sorts of things. People do this at churches too, same idea. And he goes on to say, he says, they ask, or they really, they're demanding, give me what I want, give me what I want. But he says, but few people go to the churches or the temples, be it Buddhist or Christian or whatever, and say, think, what can I give? What can I give to God? What can I give just generally? Yeah. So that is a whole different way of looking at giving. That turns giving into something powerful, actually. And when we're always asking for something, you know, wanting, demanding, then we, we become paupers, actually. <laughs> we're impoverishing ourselves. So it's very, very important. This giving is very important, but how we receive is also very important. So... And uh, the theme, I was going to call this talk because on the internet there are very clever names for attitude, uh, about uh, gratitude, gratitude. The attitude of gratitude is one of them. Uh, um, gratitude is an attitude, so I thought I've got to come up with something different. <laughs> the pressure's on. So I came up with gratitude is not a platitude. Do you know what a platitude is? <laughs> It can, it can actually be a platitude, you know. We all say these things, you know, you know like you can say things like, uh, one I thought of was, uh, uh, there's always light at the end of the tunnel, something like that. The things that are actually true, but because people say them, and they're saying them not necessarily coming from that place, they're fairly empty and hollow and, and overused. This is the point of a platitude, overused. So that's why I thought, call this uh, talk, gratitude is not a platitude. Hopefully not. So, so I'm just going to just mention a little bit about uh, now that you've been through the exam, what gratitude is. The, the purpose of developing gratitude, contentment, or any of the wholesome states of mind um, is, of course, that it fuels our practice and it overcomes our negative states of mind. So when you develop a gratitude, contentment, loving kindness, compassion, joy for others, success and their good qualities and equanimity, these sorts of emotions, respect, uh, humility. When we develop these, not only is it a very pleasant experience for us, it brings happiness. To, these bring happiness actually to the mind. But what they instantly do, like lighting a candle in the dark, they, they um, remove or reduce the negative qualities. They go down. So this is very, very useful. And this is the whole, really the whole of spiritual practice, be it Buddhist or Christian, any religion, is developing the wholesome, making uh, the po positive and reducing the negative. And it's very important too to think uh, of, um, uh, to be aware that gratitude is an emotion. Too often, I was saying this on Friday night because I gave a talk on gratitude <laughs> at the Melbourne Uni uh, Buddhist Society. So I was saying too often in the West, people know, and even in, in Sri Lanka it's the case too, that a lot of people who know the Dhamma very intellectually, they know the eight noble, the, the noble eightfold path and the three characteristics of existence and the four noble truths. And they know all this, but they're not in contact with the emotions that drive the path that make the path come alive, that make it a practice that transforms us. And that is on the emotional level. And of course, this comes from the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, Sama Sankapa. And this is called right attitude, <laughs> right attitude or right thought, it's sometimes called. Ajahn Brahm calls it right motivation. This is where we're coming from. And that is coming from the, the emphasis in, the, in that uh, aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path is giving and then loving kindness or um, friendliness, we can call it, and compassion, kindness, 
caring for others. This is, this is where the, how we practice the path, as it were. It's all very well if we know the theory and often, but we don't come from these places. If we don't come from kindness when we're practicing, say, meditation, we force the mind, the results won't be good and they won't lead to the, the goal of the Noble Eightfold Path to enlightenment. And we won't enjoy it either. That's, that's a biggie. So. And uh, gratitude is, of course, appreciation, thankful. A nice one, it's a very English uh, saying, actually. You can, a very old-fashioned saying, count your blessings or count our blessings, isn't it? That's a very old-fashioned saying. But it's very true. People don't think about that these days because, as I say, the to-do list is much bigger. <laughs> to-do list, what we need, what we want. So, and it's an antidote, of course, for fault finding, for that negative state of the mind. When we're grateful, we're not, you know, we're not, we're in a different mode from uh, the to-do list. We're in the, the mode of appreciating what we have and who's given it to us. Uh, so this is a totally different, uh, and it's like we're not taking people or situations in our lives or things for granted. Because this is, this is the usual mode people we operate from, especially if, you know, you live in day in, day out with people, you know, your wife, your family, the, your work colleagues, whoever it is, in a monastery, other monks and, uh, or nuns, depending on the, monastery, on the monastery, you can take each other for granted. And this is one of the, um, what do you say, um, enemies, perhaps you could say, uh, of gratitude. You know, taking each other for granted. So there's a nice Nas Rudin story, which I haven't told before this one, so it's good. And this was, uh, Nas Rudin is this uh, Sufi holy man who, um, you know, had this, he's supposed to have lived in Turkey in, say, the 10th century, I think, around the 10th. It's on the internet anyway, everything is. <laughs> Wikipedia, of course. So, uh, and uh, Nas Rudin was walking along a road one or you, and you can imagine seeing them off at the airport. And you don't know, we don't know, if they will return safely. We never know. Or that these people may have moved to another country or state. Or the ultimate separation. They may have died. Or we may have got a job in another country. Just to get in contact with how that feels when we bring to mind our partners, our children, our friends, and our parents. And so now we can just come out of that brief meditation. And again, another exam. When will this monk stop asking questions? <laughs> so this is just a, a test. Did you feel more uh, appreciation, uh, thankfulness, gratitude for the people that you brought to mind? Did you? Yeah. Not getting much response. but <laughs> I see people at airports. You've seen them too. Some people get really emotional at airports when they're saying goodbye to people. Because the truth is, actually, we don't know that we'll see them again. I mean, we may walk out the, the terminal door and get run over by a taxi or a bus. That's possible. They, the, the plane might crash. That's another possibility, of course. So this is a very good, uh, a good, a good way to get in contact with what? What does this bring up? It's the same with what Nazarudin was teaching, actually. It's an, yes, it's an emotion, but it points to a, a basic... Uh, a quality of reality, you know, the, the uh, I call it the, f the fly in the ointment, as it were. And that is impermanence, isn't it? Nothing lasts, that's what I like, nothing lasts. The things are, uh, are transient, they're moving all the time. This body and the mind, and the bodies and minds of everyone here, our children, our parents, everyone's moving, they, they cannot last. And there's no certainty there. We cannot be certain when we go out the uh, airport door that we'll ever see the person we saw off on the plane just a few minutes ago. As I said, it may be us, it may be them. Who knows? <laughs> so it's all not certain. And this is what 
if we really take on board, you know, the uh, the, te- the Buddha's teaching on anicca, impermanence, transience, or um, inconstancy is another word for it, then we can really appreciate the people in our lives and the things in our lives too, much, much more. And I often have given this teaching before, but uh, because it's such a good one, you can't go past it really. <laughs> When you, Ajahn Chah, a famous meditation teacher from Northeast Thailand, he passed away in 1992, but a great teacher, um, has many, many thousands of students, to the, even to this day in many branches. He'd hold up a cup and say, the cup's already broken. And people would think, what is he talking about? <laughs> what is, it's fine. <laughs> but what do you, and then he'd go on to explain that one day, even though the cup is fine now, he would say, this is northeast Thailand, one day a chicken will knock it over. And he said, then you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll hate that chicken or your child will knock it over and you'll hate that child or whatever. And he said, but if you know that this is one day it will break, when it does break, you're not as upset. Then you can let go a little bit you know, because you realise, yes, it was made, therefore it will break. So this is... And because it, we know that it's going to break, this is the point of it actually, we, we look after it as well as we can. But we know that one day it will break. And because of that, we can be less attached to it, you know, less attached to it. And when it does break, we won't be so uh, destroyed, we won't be so upset. Whether that cup that breaks is our body, <laughs> when we get sickness, when we get cancer, when we're about to die, or it's when our relationships break up, or when we lose the job, you know, lose our job, whatever it is that, you know, we, ever, whatever it is that breaks, it came together, it will break. So this is a very important teaching that allows us to have more gratitude when we realise, yeah, we're not here forever, you know. And uh, as, uh, as I get older, I get more appreciation of uh, transience, of impermanence because it's less theoretical as you get older. <laughs> You're getting closer to death, you get more problems with the body and so forth. So, you, you know, one has gratitude for what one life, that what life has offered us. So, but, that sounds quite heavy, but the main po- point on uh, reflecting on, what is the point of re- reflecting on gratitude? Anybody know? Any ideas? Can't get it wrong. Mm. Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That is actually that's that's what I say to people when you know they're grieving. It's always there. The love, the memory of that person's always there. And you know, if they go overseas or if they die. The same in some ways, you know, they're not there as it were. So what's the, the difference is just to remember when a person dies, they're still in our hearts and still in our minds. And we still have that gratitude for them too. But the purpose, the main purpose of reflecting on gratitude, or act, not only reflecting on it, practicing it really is the point, isn't it? Practicing it is to, for happiness, for happiness for ourselves. And also it cleanses the mind, it cleans the mind. It reduces the negative aspects in the in the mind by you know developing this happiness with this uh, gratitude, this thankfulness for what we have received, rather than for what we think we have to get, we need, or we, we deserve, <laughs> whatever it is that we don't have now. So now I thought uh, we can do uh, maybe just a a brief another brief meditation. And this is really to get in touch with the feeling of gratitude. This is what the other one was aimed at. You know, I can say a lot of words, give you a lot of definitions, of course, but those words, those definitions are not gratitude. They're just words. The feeling is what we're aiming at. And uh, this is what we want to cultivate in our lives, this feeling of gratitude and thankfulness. And we will actually benefit so much from it, so much from it. So, again... So you're having a lot of meditation this morning. <laughs> Probably thought, oh, I didn't come for meditation. <laughs> so now we can, this is how to develop gratitude. So we can close our eyes, if you please close your eyes, and come into the present moment again. Just be aware of sitting, being present, being here with the sounds of the air conditioners, my voice, the temperature.
now, I just ask you to reflect. What comes to mind when you hear the words, I'm so lucky, I'm so lucky? What comes to mind? Just the first responses. And then just reflect on things which make you feel, I'm so lucky. Maybe it's people, relationships, situations, health, whatever it is. And now having come in contact or having brought up a feeling, hopefully experienced a feeling, we can combine this feeling with this sense of being present, being here and now, with whatever we're aware of, the sounds, this feeling, this warmth of thankfulness, I'm so lucky, just combining it with the experience of being present. I'm so lucky, sound of the air conditioner. I'm so lucky, feeling sitting on the chair or on the floor. And now we can slowly come out of the meditation, open our eyes and continue with the talk. <laughs> so how did people find that? Did you find your, I'm so lucky, did you feel that was a positive? If you, if you didn't, if you, felt, if you hear that phrase, I'm so lucky, and you think, Wow, what about uh, you know work and the terrible situation I've got at work? Those you know the, some of the, the boss terrible. You know, if you do that, that's worth noting too. You're just seeing what's going in, on in your mind, and that's good to note in the first to begin with. See what comes up. It's an experiment, but then we always realise that to develop this sort of you know positive emotions like I, from I'm so uh, I'm so lucky. You know, to look for things then that one is, you know, genuinely feels very fortunate to have in one's life, people, uh, situations and things. And I would encourage people, you know, this is just a little experiment for you take it away and there's no, uh, there's no test, there's no real test or, <laughs> or no correct answer or anything like that. Um, Ajay. Yes. The regarding that, isn't it two-sided? To some people, when they say, I'm so lucky, that, as what you pointed out, I'm so lucky, but mm. I have cancer. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, that comes up, that comes up. That so, comes uh, up. I mean, how are you going to counter that? Oh, I'm yeah. so lucky, I'm, I'm so sick at the moment. Yes, good. Oh, I'm so poor at the moment. <laughs> good. Thank you for asking that, Adrian. That's a very, that's a very good one, actually. So it's important. These, Hopefully there are other things in your life beside the cancer, you know. It's true, you know, when you think, I'm so lucky, the largest big issue in your life will come up. There's no doubt about that. And if it is cancer, of course it comes up. But they are not, that's not the thing you're particularly grateful about at that time. You're probably not grateful for having cancer. Um, but there are other things. You might think, yeah, I've got cancer, but, oh, my family's fantastic like the monk who I share with next door. His mother passed away, uh, not last Thursday, the Thursday before, and his family were almost there 24-7. You know, so she's dying. This is not a pleasant experience for anybody. <laughs> and he's, but she's got the support 24-7, almost, not quite, you know, of her family. And that must have made it so good for her to be able to you know, experience that love, that care, not being alone, as it were. You know, so... Even if we have cancer, even if we are dying, there's always something that I'm so glad, I'm so lucky about. 
Um, and also I'd say, you know, if people really, really go into looking at the difficult things in their lives, this was later in the talk actually, but it comes up now, is uh, sometimes we can be grateful for the, the real difficulties in our life, the tragedies in our life. They can turn out to be turning points for us and our lives would not be what they were, what they have become without them. And this sounds very theoretical and then one can be grateful even for having cancer. Uh, even for any number of things, actually. And it reminds me of a, uh, um, a very, very uh, moving uh, video I saw. This is a teacher in America. She's known as Byron Katie. Have you seen? Some people will know Byron Katie. She's quite, quite an interesting teacher, a very wonderful teacher, actually. And she was talking to a man that uh, had cancer. He had a patch over his eye, and they didn't actually say what sort of cancer he had. And he's, you know, he'd obviously pretty sick and, um, you know, he'd been through a lot. I don't know if he was recovering. And she, and one part of her uh, technique is to ask four questions and the turnaround. And uh, this turnaround is taking the opposite stance from what your original idea is. So his original idea is um, having this cancer is the worst thing in my life. Fair enough. Most people would agree with that. But then she, she, uh, she, she said to him, now the turnaround for that, what's the opposite? And he said, cancer is the best thing in my life. <laughs> wow. You know, it just knocks you off your seat when you hear that. You just, you know, even for you or for myself, when I hear that, I think, wow, how can he say that? And you, know, you could see him taking, you know, a few deep breaths and think, why is this the case, you know? And then he said, you know, that it really brought him close to his family. He was a businessman, he was a, like an exec or a COO, CEO type. And he said he never had much time for his family or anything, you know. And he said when he got the cancer, you know, his family were there for him, his wife, his children and other friends were there for him. And he really had quality time with them instead of thinking, you know, I've got to rush to the next meeting, got to get ready for the next board meeting or whatever it is that he was running with. And that was one of the things. And then she said, and expecting another thing, and he came up with a whole list of things. If you want to see that uh, video clips on YouTube, Byron Katie, you know, it's one, I think, something to do with cancer, probably you find it. So this is, this is true for all of us. If we really, you know, many of these things that are real tragedies, really difficult in our life, later when we reflect on them, they can have, uh, you know, we, a platitude is every cloud has a silver lining. <laughs> That's a platitude, actually. But it's sometimes true, actually, that uh, things that we take as the worst possible thing that could ever happen to us, when it happens, it actually turns into a blessing and our lives would not have been the same. And uh, maybe it's a bit of a digression, but I will mention it too now, is um, one of my favourite videos that I was sent, actually, somebody sent me this from YouTube, of course, everything <laughs> on YouTube. It's either Wikipedia or YouTube. <laughs> And this is Janine the Machine. Does any people here know Janine the Machine, that one? Yeah. That's fantastic video on YouTube. She's an Aussie, even, even more interesting, Janine uh, Shepherd, Janine Shepherd. And uh, this is a presentation she gave at, uh, uh, like, looked like a seminar in 2016. She did a TED Talk too. The one I saw wasn't a TED Talk. Um, and she relates her experience of, uh, she was an athlete, she was 24, and 1988, she wanted to go, she was going to the Olympics, that's her idea. She was in training and she was on this long bike ride and she'd been riding for five and a half hours. When, just close to the end of the, the ride, she got hit by a truck, got hit by a truck and uh, everything went black and she sustained... Uh, uh, six breaks uh, um, in the back than the spine. She had, uh, the spine was severed in six places. I think the spine, actually. And she had uh, the skin peeled back, the skull exposed, the side open, gravel in there, everything. For 10 days, she hung on between life and death. And then just on the 10th day, she, she had this determination. This is the word for her. <laughs> determination to come back into the body. And she did. And she said, miraculously, when she had this determination, instead of hovering between life and death, to come back to the body, the bleeding, internal bleeding stopped, which was massive, you know, as you can imagine, after you've been hit by a truck. And so she was back in this body, which was very painful and everything, and then she spent six months in the spinal unit recovering. She was in a full body cast. She was in a wheelchair, and the doctor said, at best, 
she may and she had to use a catheter. And they said this would be for life. <laughs> she may get some feeling back in her feet in a lower part of her body. And she did actually have some, uh, still some movement that she could do, which is amazing. And then the nurse said to her, Janine, when you go home, this is the point of the, the, the name, you're going to get depressed. Everyone does. And she said, not me, I'm Janine the machine. <laughs> and she said, I went home, I got depressed. <laughs> she said, I was crying, my mum was crying, <laughs> both crying. And she said, one day she went out uh, onto the veranda in her wheelchair and full body cast. And she looked up into the sky, she was looking at the nature and everything. And then she saw this plane through, fly through the air. And, she, and then the thought, this is very human, I thought this is just how human beings think. If I can't walk, I can fly. Maybe I can fly. And so she had this determination to learn to fly. Here she is in a full body cast, and in a wheelchair and everything. How, I mean, crazy, isn't it? But human beings are like that. And so she did. She went to the local Bankstown airport. It's a little, uh, little uh, airport for the smaller planes, I think. And she went there and she said she went to the counter and uh, she saw these people. Uh, she was coming for her first uh, flying lesson. And she said she could see them looking at it and think, oh, my God. <laughs> she said they were out the back drawing the short straw. Who was going to take it for, for a ride, take it for the flight? And eventually she did. This person called Andrew took her for a flight. And she took her off. And, you know, he had, they have dual control. So, you know, that uh, wasn't, uh, uh, you know, she wasn't totally in, in charge of the, fl uh, the plane. And so, and as they went towards the Blue Mountains where the accident happened, this, her instructor said, now it's your turn, turn Janine, take, take, uh, take the controls and fly over the Blue Mountains. And she's really, she said, that's where my journey began. You can see it was very emotional when she, when she uh, remembered that. But she did, she flew. And then not, not only that, after that, she continued flying and she continued trying to walk. And she said, uh, you know, she, uh, the turning point for her, she said, was, she used to think, why me? This is a turning point for all of us, actually. She said, why me? And what we all ask when a tragedy happens. And then it turned around to, why not me? And of course, that's the truth of life. Why not me? I'm experiencing it. And so she learned to walk again. You know, she taught herself. She said, first of all, it was she could only raise her foot about an inch, you know, both feet, I think one at a time. And then she said she could walk with two people, then one, peop one person. And then she could walk if she could clutch on, hold on to the furniture, as long as it wasn't too far apart, she says. And then, uh, so she was walking, being able to walk again. And she, not only did she continue her flying lessons, she became, got her private pilot's license, so she could fly around. Then she flew around Australia, I think, I suppose, solo, just on her own. And then she got a commercial pilot's <coughs> license. And then she got her instructor's license. And, uh, and, and so she was now teaching people in the same place. <laughs> she, she came for lessons. It's amazing. And the first flight she took was just 12 months after she left, less than 12 months after she left the Spinal Ward. Fantastic. Amazing. And the very Buddhist thing she says at the end of it, and this is part of her presentation, it's a good video if you'd like to see it, very moving. She says, and uh, um, I realised that I'm Janine, I'm not the body, I'm not the body, she said. And she says to the audience, and you, my friends, are not your bodies. We're the indomitable spirit, we're that, that determination. This is the word we use in Buddhism, we call it adhisthana or aditana, determination. She has it in, amazing, amazingly. So here is a person who had this terrible accident but in actual fact, if she hadn't had that accident, I don't know if Janine is grateful for it, I doubt it. <laughs> but she's grateful for what came after, I'm sure. You know, she would not have been that person. And there's so many people like that. And their lives are very inspiring for us and give us hope that we too can deal with life as well. You know. So this is, uh, this is one way we can be grateful for things that are difficult in life. You know and that make us who we are, actually. So, unfortunately, we grow from, uh, we, in Buddhism we say dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, unhappiness, or suffering. We grow from those experiences, not so much from when we're comfortable 
life is going along smoothly and we're coasting. It's when we get these real hiccups, these things that shouldn't be, that we don't want, that then we really grow into quite a different person from what we, we were before, perhaps. But I was going to say with the, that meditation on I'm so lucky, this was the point to make with that. I mean, during the day, we can use mantras like that. They used to call these things affirmations. But it's not, affirmation always made me feel like you're trying to convince yourself of something. And I think that's not the point. <laughs> just to bring up the feeling, I'm so lucky. And so just to realize that each and every one of us is running on mantras during the day. I've met people and I've seen myself too. You know, some of the mantras that we're running on, things like, I can't, I can't, you know. And if we have a mantra like that, it's really, you know, uh, disabling. It will disable us actually. And we're running on these mantras. So choose a mantra that's going to give us you know, a, a, a good quality, bring up happiness, first of all, bring up happiness and bring up a positive quality that can lead to our spiritual development and growth. Let's not, you know, let's realise what programming we're running on because this is our, our uh, as Buddhists actually, the Buddha taught that everything comes from causes and conditions and he talked about his train, about uh, his path of being a path of training. Training is actually... Um, causes and conditionings. We're conditioning ourselves in a different way. And this is the whole point of it. Conditioning is like establishing habits. This, in this case, good habits. We've got many bad habits, negative habits. <laughs> we can well do without. They don't produce happiness. So this is good habits. All right. So I think now from... Uh, yes, well... Good. Maybe I'll tell another story... <laughs> from uh, this one a bit lighter, so that's good. And that is the two friends, two friends met, two old friends met, and one of them looked very glum and looked a bit depressed, and the other one said, what's the problem? And his friend said, well, three weeks ago my uncle died and left me $50,000. And, and the other friend said, in that case, uh, you should be happy. And he said, well... Then two weeks ago, my cousin died and left me a hundred thousand. And and he said, "What's the problem?" <laughs> and he said, "Well, last week, last week, my grandmother died and she left half a million dollars to me." And he said, "What's the problem? This is great." He said, "This week there hasn't been anything." <laughs> that's how we. That's how we are. Is. It's really amazing, but that's how we are. We're not grateful for the other things in between. So, so let's. Uh, we're getting close to the end because there will be some questions. I think one of the uh, the things that I was going to mention about uh, <laughs> about uh, um, gratitude is that it cushions that, that cushions us in hard times, and we've just mentioned that. Thanks to thank you, Adrian, for that. That was good. Please do check out Janine the Machine. I think amazing, really good. But gratitude has so many good good uh, um, benefits that it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to mention them all. As I say, contentment. It reduces our sense of isolation. Because often people, you know, in our society, even though we live in large numbers and in cities and so on, can feel lonely, you know, and separated. But when we have this idea of gratitude, it actually... Um, thank for being thankful. It connects us, and this is a very um, important aspect of of um, gratitude or thankfulness. It connects us to other people. We're thankful to them. We realise that we have uh, what we have because of them. It may be, you know, just qualities they have. Sometimes you're very thankful, not material things. You know, just for the things they've shared with us, the support they've given us at difficult times, being there for us. They're the things we can be very thankful. And these days, as I say, you know, just having time for another person <laughs> is pretty, pretty amazing, you know, because people's lives are busy. And so this is, this is one of the things it does, builds bridges. And it builds the very important quality we all need is empathy. You know, being able to put ourselves in the place of others, you know, it builds this sense of, uh, uh, of realising that the things we would like or dislike 
very likely other people wouldn't like or dislike, things we might do or say. And I always use that as a test for what I'm going to do and say. When I say always, not always. <laughs> but I try to keep it in mind. Would I like to hear this? Would I like to get the, have received this action that I'm about to do for somebody else? So it's very good to, as I say, put yourself in other people's place, to have that sense of empathy. And gratitude is great. And they often say that and it's a sign of real emotional maturity, spiritual maturity too, the more grateful we are, you know, um, just for the simple things of life, you know, the flowers, the trees, the air we have, the water, all those things which we may not be so grateful for, you know, because we all need, don't we, food, we need, this is what the Buddha was talking about, the four requisites, food, and we need clothing, we need shelter, we need medicines. So we can be very thankful for those things. One of the uh, people I know, she has this lovely, uh, it's more of a contentment, um, uh, contentment exercise, but it's also gratitude. She says, when she turns the tap on in the morning and water comes out, she's so grateful. She's so, <laughs> so grateful. I mean, many people, we turn the tap on every day. We don't think that, do we? We think, you know, far from it. It's not warm enough. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, whatever. It's got too much chlorine in it or something. So, so I think... Uh, I think maybe there we can finish. There's many things I was going to go on for, you know, about what we can great, be grateful for. And we've touched on some of those things. So I'd like to finish there because I think there will be some questions from the internet. But first of all, questions... Do we have uh, questions from the floor? Uh, Just briefly. Hello. Yeah. The, say, if you really look at uh, human mm. life, mm. there's not a single human being yes. can live without other human beings. If you really understand that, mm. it is pretty obvious that everyone should have gratitude to all humanity. Thank you for that. That's true. We are all very interconnected. Uh, so, and these days, if you live in a, a city and so on, we're incredibly interconnected. I mean, the uh, you know, we all the all the things that we use, for instance, we don't know the farmers that grew the food, that packed the, the people who pack the food, they sell the food, and so on. The electricity, the water, everything we're getting is is coming from so many people, and that's why a society like this really needs to be very peaceful in order to all function. If it doesn't, we don't have peace, then it can all fall apart. And then we can start going to the tap in the morning and think, oh, no water. Or the next day you go, ah, oh, there's water, fantastic. <laughs> it's really good. So it's very important because we do, we, we all live together. And there's a lot of, you know, the, I will give another talk about it. The, the uh, gratitude we can feel for our parents actually is an important one. Uh, the place of parents in Buddhism is an important uh, subject because it's one in the West that there's a very different take on parents, which is not the Buddhist take, actually. <laughs> so it's much kinder, actually. So, uh, yes, thank you for that, Dr. Jaya. And are there any questions from the internet? There are no questions from the internet. Oh, that's all right. That's good. I thought gratitude, gratitude is something that many speakers... <laughs> I'm grateful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. They're probably still asleep. <laughs> yes, would you like? Is that? Ah, right. Three Jews. Yes? Yes. Thank you, Ajahn. Sometimes when you, um, you know, travel to a third world country, it's, um, you know, the, you're talking about water. You, you don't have clean water. Yes. And, um, you know, even to have a warm shower, it's not even available to you. So that's when you really can feel gratitude towards what you have back at home. But how do you bring the practice when you're back at home so that you do have the gratitude of that warm shower and that water as it flows out the tap? How, how do you bring that practice mm. in? Yes. Well, I hope that exercise that I had of imagining you being separated from people and things would help. So it, we, whatever way we can bring up that sense of remembering perhaps what it was like when we were in a place where there wasn't any uh, uh, warm water, where the, the water wasn't there all the time or the conditions weren't like what we're used to here in Australia. Uh, that can help us to have that gratitude, to realise that maybe most of the world 
uh, uh, in, in most of the world. The things we take for granted are not, <laughs> not necessarily available all the time. They can be intermittent. So that's the, real, that's the way I would encourage that. And also, as I say, you know, just this, I'm so um, lucky, changing the perspective, trying to get some balance in the mind between the to-do list, which sees everything that uh, we need, need to get or we think we need to get, and the, the things that are actually there that we can really appreciate, see the pluses in our lives. So maybe to those two things, you know, I'm so lucky, and also just thinking of the times when you haven't had those things uh, to bring up <coughs> gratitude uh, for them. Most important ones to have thankfulness or gratitude for are the people in our lives, really, the people in our lives, because th that really improves our relationship. And also, it... It, it's also in accord with reality too because we, in actual fact, the people in our lives, whoever they are, mother, father, children, uh, friends, whoever they are, work colleagues, they won't be there forever. <laughs> we, we act as if they're there forever but that's not the case. And this is where people can you know, take others for granted or mistreat them badly mistreat them because they, they're not taking on board the fact that no, you know, I'm not here forever, they're not here forever. And when we do remember that, we can actually realise that this is quite precious, what we have now, and it's passing, it's passing. So for instance, when, with children, you know, parents with children, you know, that time when they're young will pass and they become their own persons, as it were, when they grow up. So we just treasure when we're there with them at that age, whatever age we're at. You know, I have, uh, as I grow older, I have this, uh, it increasingly comes to me, the feeling that, you know, you remember the past, but as you grow older, you realise you cannot step back into that past. You know, they have this saying about you can't step into a river, the same river twice. It's the same idea, actually. That you can remember your friends, you remember situations you had, and it was... Um, you know, you, you really found them very dear, they're very important for you at the time. But you realise too, you can't step back. The course and conditions, they've moved on, the stream's moved on. And this is our life. This is samsara, actually. This is a, the Buddha's concept of being born and reborn over and over again. That time is moving, transience, that uh, um, impermanence is happening all the time. So that, that in the, the bigger picture <laughs> should make us you know, appreciate others particularly, you know, because they won't always be there, we won't always be there. So I hope that answered the question a little, uh, Sri Juth, you know. Yeah, th thank you. Yes, maybe go for Thank you, Ajahn. Um, my question is, is there a difference between feeling grateful, feeling happy, mm -hmm. and feeling contented? Because they're pretty much, at least, what I feel, it's pretty similar. They are actually, they're fairly similar. But uh, yeah, I, I did think about this actually and, and uh, sort of uh, felt about it, <laughs> did some feeling about it. Gratitude is more a sense of, uh, has more of a sense of being thankful to others, to situations. Whereas contentment, they are very related. Contentment is, just, is not so focused towards others, to what life's offered us and so on, just to what we already have. We're not thinking of where it came from. Content, uh, gratitude is thinking of where it came from and being grateful for that, for that gift, whether it be from parents, uh, family, friends, whoever, or life itself. We're looking at where it came from, you know, so we are acknowledging, grat gratitude is acknowledging, knowing what has been done and then having this feeling, this response about what has been done, which is being thankful. Whereas contentment is the feeling that um, we have enough, everything, you know, it's fine as it is, what I have in my life, even if, you know, we, there's many things we need, contentment has the sense of, it's enough, I don't need anything. Contentment is a sense of being wealthy, actually, in a way, because, you know, what you have is enough. That feeling. It's the opposite of the want list, you know, the to-do list, to-get list. <laughs> so they're a little bit different. And what often uh, they'll say, uh, I think Ajahn Brahm said that gratitude will lead to contentment. You know, when you're grateful to people, situations in your life, then it develops this sort of sense of contentment with what you've got. This is enough. 
you know, rather than, as I say, the to get list, which is huge, <laughs> it's unlimited. So there is a slight, uh, uh, you know, a slight difference. But, you know, I notice with all these positive emotions, for me anyway, they have a very similar feeling, you know, warmth, uh, expansiveness, relaxation, kindness, or, you know, in them, you know. So they have very f- a similar feeling. So, but uh, that's, that's just, in, you know, a way of uh, expressing it anyway. Gratitude, those that have given, have influenced us, given us those, these things that we're grateful for, thankful for, contentment, the actual things that we have, we have enough. You know, so I hope that answered it. And of course, the biggest thing to be grateful for is a spiritual teaching that makes head, what do you, what do you say, makes sense of our lives. So that's very important. And this is where the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha is ultimately the thing that, uh, for, for Buddhists at least, you know, gives meaning and purpose to our life, gives framework to understanding what this is about, you know, the life, life that we experience, making sense of it. And this is what all spiritual teachings uh, endeavour to do. And so this is actually very, very valuable. This is the most important gift we have because without it, we tend to be, as it were, you know, sort of going around in darkness, trying to make sense of things, you know, trying to put it together. What's it all about? That sort of uh, questions, the big questions about life, the meaning of life. So I'd like to finish there, the meaning of life. And those who'd like to... I th- oh, all right, yes. All right, there's one question online, I think. Yes, so um, there's a question online asking, um, this person would like to know more about Buddhism thoughts on parents. And that was the question. Oh, all right, Buddhism thoughts on parents. I will probably I'll give a talk on that. I plan to give a talk on that actually because it's a very important karmic relationship. I'll just say that briefly, that uh, you know we're not accidentally born to our parents. You know, our mother and father. There is a connection uh, from the past. We say from past lives, and we have had a desire to be born there. Of course, that brings up questions of well, you know, when you have parents that are like. Uh, angels, that's fine, but sometimes some parents are not like that. You know, we hear uh, some astounding reports of people who treat their children badly. But there's nevertheless, there is a strong connection that has brought one in, into uh, to being born with those parents. And uh, in Buddhism, and uh, I know one monk said, and I think it's very true, even if our parents were uh, very cruel and callous, he said, they give it, gave us one gift, the gift of life. And then we can make of it what we wish, you know. We'll make of it as we can. So this is an important gift, no matter whether they were good parents or not, you know. But I'll talk about that uh, uh, on another occasion. And the Buddha was also talking about how we repay our parents. That's part of that talk, actually, how we repay our parents. And I'll just leave you with this stunning image from the Buddha. It's unforgettable. (laughs) He was very good at these unforgettable images. He said that if we were to carry our parents around on our shoulders, our mum on one side and our dad on one side, and we were massaging them, feeding them, giving them drinks, and they were to urinate and defecate on us while while they were sitting on our shoulders, for a hundred years, he said, this would not be enough to repay them. Pretty amazing. You try and forget that one. (laughs) And then he goes on to tell you how you can repay your parents, and that's another talk. But that's amazing, isn't it? You know, he's really making the point that our connection with our parents is really super strong, supercharged relationship. And the idea we often get in the West, you know, where people will say, I've heard, I've heard uh, people say this, I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> you know, you, maybe your kids have said this, I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> you know, and I think that's, uh, of course, in Buddhism we say, well, that's not true, actually. <laughs> you were in there. <laughs> you wanted to. So that's another talk, and thank you for coming today, and I hope that was of interest to you, and I hope that gratitude is not a platitude for you, and you make it a vehicle for your happiness and well-being. Sorry, Ajahn, there's one last question from online. Yes, just... (laughs) Sorry, we'll be quick. Um, So this question asks about, what about gender? Are we born into the proper gender? Are we born into the proper... (laughs) We're, we're, born, we're born into the gender we're attracted to, actually, to a large extent. Yes, yes. No, I do think this is another, de- another in-depth sort of question. <laughs> I have thought about it. I have thought about it. So, there, yes, I think uh, we, we're reborn, according to our, 
agenda according to uh, or karma in a, a large extent in the sense that most often, well not always, people want to be the same sex as they were in the past life, but that's not always the case. Because, and you know in many societies, and you can see it, this is uh, more, uh, you know, this is my idea particularly, that, you know, for instance, in many women, for instance, in societies may feel disempowered, uh, they feel like women are not getting an equal deal, and that's, that's true in most of history and that they prefer to be reborn as a man. Because then, you know, because often women think, men have got it easy. <laughs> so if you die with that thought, you may take a masculine body. So that could uh, change your gender, as it were. I don't know the other way. Men have got more, more of an attachment to being men, actually. And if you say, I've, I remember saying this to somebody, I thought, saying, you know, we can, our gender can change when we uh, take rebirth. And he was more or less saying, well, a man can't, you know, <laughs> it's not possible. And I said, well, you know, it is possible, but if we are very attached to being, say, a man, and, and many men will be, you know, identified with that because, because it's a, a comfortable, something they're comfortable with, they're used to, and also it gives them a lot of benefits that they wouldn't have if they were born as a woman, say, for instance. So uh, then they continue as a man, so... And then, this, uh, then you can get, with the gender, uh, changing gender, you can get all issues of uh, homosexuality and so on coming up. And I think it makes sense to me in that context, you know, that people are born with their sexuality coming from their past life. <laughs> you know, that's, that's where I think the seeds are from coming from the past life. So we can change gender, yes. And, uh, and it just depends on what we're more attached to, being a male, being a female, whatever. So I'd like to thank you with that. That's, that's a bit of a pot boiler, isn't it? <laughs> so we can finish there and just, if you'd like, pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha.